are live. My name is Anthony Krizowitz, and I am excited to have another evening with a band that l recently I've fallen in love with. I And I've said that often over the last couple of weeks, but it's interesting as we continue this quarantine mode that we're in, that we go down the rabbit hole and learn about all these great bands. And listen, if you're a Pearl Jam fan like myself and you're looking forward to live shows, we do know of some next year. And the band that we're about to talk to you know is going to be playing with them at the See Here Now Festival next September. So I am excited tonight to have with me Joe and James from Jackson Pines, who will be taking the stage before Pearl Jam next year. So guys, Jackson Pines, welcome to the Touring Fan Live. How's it going, Anthony? Thank you so much for having us tonight. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure for the beer. Yeah, both of you. And I will say that, you know, it is interesting that um, I've done 147 shows and I've never matched uh, walls with anyone before. Um, so I think it's quite interesting that me and James, we uh, we match walls. Uh, that's that's a new thing for us. I thought they only sold this in Jackson. I guess I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask this before we get into the the into Jackson Pines and you guys a little bit even more, you know, for me as a music lover and a Pearl Jam fan and everything like that, I, is it exciting when you guys play a festival with a band knowing like Pearl Jam's playing after you and you're playing like the same surroundings as them? I mean, it's it's always a shock for us, first of all, to be, you know, invited to play a big festival at all. Just to be honest, I mean, I think James could attest to that too, that, you know, we uh, are really honored and humbled to be a part of See Here Now next year. Um, and yeah, I mean, as kids growing up, like, I mean, I was, you know, right in the middle of the 90s was when I was coming into loving, you know, modern music and not just the music that my parents played, but like finding music myself and my big sister, discovering her CD collection. And one of the first things I remember, you know, finding, you know, beyond like a bunch of other records was like Verses by Pearl Jam it was actually the first thing I heard. You know, I heard like hits on the radio, but like that was the first full Pearl Jam album I actually heard in its entirety was Verses, not 10, believe it or not. Um, wow. But, you know, uh, just to be able to play a show like that and yet yeah, to know that we're able to uh, be on the same bill as someone that, you know, grew up playing music independently. We're an unsigned band where we don't have a manager. We do everything ourselves. Me and James book all the shows together. We drive around together. We, you know, record and produce all the music and buy all the merch together. And uh, to be able to represent, you know, New Jersey and Ocean County and open up for bands like, yeah, Pearl Jam and the Smashing Pumpkins and, you know, just bands that if you told me as a five-year-old that we'd be playing a festival with Pearl Jam and Smashing Pumpkins, I wouldn't have believed you. So it's amazing. It's really, really cool. James, what do you think about all this? You pretty much took the words out of my mouth. I mean, yeah, it's, I don't think it's really set in yet. I mean, we're very excited, but it's, it's just, uh, it's hard to wrap your head around until I guess you're actually there, but yeah, it's just, we're just totally excited and honored to be a part of it. It's going to be fun, <laughs> especially after the year everybody's had. I think it, when it finally does happen, it's going to be like a major uh, celebration, you know? It's gonna be really cool, for sure. Yeah, I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to myself. Let me ask you this: How did you guys get invited? As we stay on topic for See Here Now Festival, uh, which, which again is going to be uh, next September. How did you guys get invited to that festival? What was it like to be, you know, included or invited out to something as special as that? You know, it's 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 like a it's a crazy. Um, uh, constellation of occurrences over the last couple of years. I mean, me and James have been playing together for the last 10, 11 years now, uh, consistently. Um, as teenagers, we play together for fun and we a lot in the same basement. But over the last 10 years, me and James being in two different bands, um, you know, we met a lot of people. So one of the people we got to meet over the course of the last 10 years was Tim Donnelly. Um, and Tim Donnelly has always been a huge champion for us and supported us. So James, if you wanted to talk a little bit about how we met Tim Donnelly, I'll uh, after you all I'll talk about how we met Tim. Yeah, um, basically goes back to Asbury Park, and uh, that's where 
me and Joe pretty much grew up playing. We traveled there when we were younger and played in separate bands. And then our last band, Thomas Wesley Stern, was playing there a lot. And Tim was always right there helping us out with getting better shows for more people, traveling shows in other states and all that. And he really, he's uh, he's one of the main people that really helped us get our foot in the door in, in this state and other states. So, and then it, uh, now we're here, you know, so he's, he's always come through for us big time. Yeah. Like with, with Tim, he's, he's from Ocean County, right by like where we're from in Jackson. And, you know, he helped us play at, you know, little art gallery shows and he helped book us in New Orleans when we were 21 and we didn't know what we were doing as a young band, but he believed in us and said, drive down there, we'll have a show. So we did it. We met the guys from Preservation Hall because of him. And like over the years, he helped us throw CD release parties. Um, then fast forward to 2015 and he hooked us up with uh, the people who were in the Mumford and Sons Traveling Festival. So we got to play as a part of that festival back in the day. So, you know, once in a while, you know, he's the kind of friend where we don't talk all the time, but when we talk, we meet up and we have a really great time and he asked us to play a show. It's always a real thing, it's always serious. So I was driving back to Manhattan in January um, and I got a call on the phone from Tim and I picked it up and I said, hey, what's up? And he said, hey, Joe, do you want to play See Here Now this year? Said, Hell yeah. <laughs> and then he said, all right, I'll talk to you later. And I said, all right, later. And then, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just kind of how we do things. <laughs> now, when he told you about the festival, all right, we're getting we're getting kind of like an audio feedback. I don't know which one it's from. Yeah, so can I grab some headphones real quick? Yeah, grab some headphones. All right. It could be mine, too. Give me one second. I'll be right back. Yeah, no, no, it's all right. my charger. Right, you guys do what you got to do. I'll, uh, all right, anyway, I'll, anyway, so. No, 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 no. No, it's all good. Well, you know, what's interesting for me, um, let me do this. What's interesting for me, it's, let me see. Is it, no, there we go. What's interesting for me is we found, like, when I found out about you guys originally, um, and you guys were playing, and that you guys were on the on the bill. I always like to look at festivals that I'm going to for Pearl Jam and see like, what am I? You know, what am I going to be hearing and stuff? What's going to be on the festival bills? So I actually got to dig deep into Jackson Pines, and yeah, it was it was this Americana sound coming out, and it was this beautiful sound. that I'm like, all right, so this band's got to be from like you know Mississippi, Virginia, West Virginia, something like that. And the next thing you know, it's wait a minute, this band's from New Jersey. I'm like, wait a minute, the only thing I know from New Jersey is Jersey Shore. And I'm like, this is kind of an interesting uh, feel, but no, I, really digging the music and everything that's coming from it. It's It's been pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, it surprised a lot of people uh, when they find out that there's actually, you know, a couple folky type bands that actually come from New Jersey. And it's not just because, um, you know, a big part of it is you know, we grew up listening to a lot of folk revival music. I mean, we were exposed to influenced by it. But at the same rate, there's a history of fiddle and folk music in South Jersey that's actually been there for 100 or 150 years or more. Um, we were lucky about 10 years ago to be uh, invited like family into Albert Music Hall, which is in Ware Town, New Jersey, off of Route 9. And we learned you know, a lot about playing live folk music there. So if you go down to Albert Music Hall, we can't right now, but hopefully when everything uh, opens back up next year, you can go there every Saturday and hear live bluegrass and folk live country. Uh, and they keep the tradition alive. So we come from that tradition a little bit. We don't play straight up folk, we don't play bluegrass, we play original music. But you can tell by listening to it that we've been influenced by it for a long time. What do you think, James? You hit the nail on the head again. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of people don't know that, uh, like you said, there's like New Jersey does, it's any kind of music you want, you know, there's a pretty big scene of all kinds. But like where I live right now, a half hour south is out, like you said, Albert Hall. And you can go there any Saturday night and there's guys sitting around playing a dozen banjos trading songs and so there is there's a rich uh history of all that music you'll hear all these old traditionals and songs they wrote themselves or grandfathers wrote and it's cool so I mean, there really is 
there's a place for that music, you know, in New Jersey, which you wouldn't really, people don't really expect, but. Well, let me ask you something. What was, James, for you, we'll start with you. What was your influences growing up, like music wise? Was it, th was this Americana folk or was it something that was different to you, for you? I mean, did you grow up on this and this was your bread and butter or did you grow up on something completely different before finding this kind of space for your music? Um, I grew up on it in a way, but it, it didn't really uh, grab me until later on. I was all about like punk rock and everything. I had like big hair and stuff. And uh, But uh, my family members, my grandpa, my grandma, they all loved like Hank Williams Sr. He was in my grandpa's welding shop all the time. My mom had Johnny Cash CDs in her car. So I was always around it, but it didn't really like hit home to me, you know, cause I was kind of just like, I didn't really give it any time. And then, uh, I love social distortion. And then mm. they, uh, when I was, I think I was like middle school, they covered ring of fire. And I was like, wait, I know that song. Like, Oh, well, if they think that's cool, then maybe <laughs> I was missing something this whole time. So I was like, and then that kind of opened the door for me to like, getting into Johnny Cash more and Bob Dylan and all that. And, but so it's probably yeah, like high school age, it, it, something clicked in my head. Like I should probably pay attention to my uh, family members. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, what was your influences growing up? Cause I'm assuming you probably seen the same path. I think we all do that. I mean, on the last episode of the show, we were, I was talking to another artist and we were talking about like embarrassing music that we'd listen to that we'd look, we listen, like you ever listen to like something from when you were younger and put it on now. And it was like your favorite song. Then you're like, wait a minute, this is, this is complete horseshit. Like this is terrible music. And now you're like, what the hell was I thinking then? But. Well, that's, that's interesting. It's like, you know, if I think backwards about something like that, um, you know, I mean, I guess as a kid, no matter who you are, whether you think you're some kind of, uh, you know, well uh, schooled, you know, musical listener, you think like everything you ever listened to is cool. I mean, I mean, I listened to like Smash Mouth and stuff when I was a kid. Like it was on the radio. I mean, at the same time, I was interested in stuff like, you know, Smashing Pumpkins and like uh, I was I was really into like Phil Collins as a kid. That's like not cool. But to answer your question differently, I still think Phil Collins is pretty cool. So I mean, listening to like, you know, pop stuff on the radio can be cringy at times, but like I still listen back to like a lot of that power pop radio stuff that seems really bad. Like I still can like listen to like a third eye blind song and be like, that's like a really well written song. It's like really well done, no matter how much people might like paint it as being like just pop or something. But I don't think third eye blind is pop. Um I, yeah, that's an interesting. I, mean, one. I, I guess in in like a rock and roll, like yeah, it's popular. Point, it's 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 popular. It's the pop, yeah. you know what I mean? But I guess the worst thing probably like I listened to as a kid was like Weird Al Yankovic. But again, I still listen to it and like it. So yeah. I don't think it's really that bad. <laughs> it's it is kind of weird, you know. That is God. I haven't thought of Weird Al Yankovic in a very long time. That's uh yeah. I can't go Amish Paradise. I mean that that was a classic. Um. <laughs> And yeah, and he, he had to have lawsuits and everything, so it must have been a huge hit. Yeah. So when did you guys find each other? Well, we were both from the same hometown, but we didn't go to the same high school. I went to Catholic school out of town my whole life. James went to public school in town. So I guess like we started crossing paths when we were like 15, 16. James, mm -hmm. like he said, he, he was in punk bands when he was like 13, 14. And I was in like acoustic emo bands and stuff like that, like really into like Bright Eyes and Elliot Smith and like, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then over the years, our bands were really close friends. and We would play together all the time. So I had a band when I was 16 called The Boy Judas. He was in a band called Mad Feather Group. And we'd play like, you know, pizzerias and like VFWs and church halls and a lot of basements and backyards. So that's when we really became like friends. And then, you know, we became bandmates years later. James, let me ask you something. Because one thing that I, I, I love asking people is, do you remember your first band name? Um, yeah, it was, uh, well, Bank Shot was the one. We sang at this pool hall on Route 9. <laughs> and uh, 
someone hit a bank shot and a guy next door was like, somebody said it. We didn't know what it meant. And we said, oh, that's, that's cool. That's a cool name. So that's stuck for a few months. But I think that there might be another one in there somewhere, but that's the first one I remember. That was like 13 or something. Joe, do you remember your first band name? Yeah, I do. And it was just me by myself in my bedroom. And uh, it was called Virus Scan. <laughs> so I was spending a lot of time in front of my uh, Windows PC. And it was virus.scan. <laughs> like, like an EXE, which is terrible. Oh, God. I think it's always like interesting to think about the names of bands that like musicians come up with at, oh, yeah. at a really younger age. Because back then, like I remember my first band name. You think back to it, like, you put so much either thought into it or no thought at all. But it was the coolest thing ever. And you were saying, like, uh, probably not the smartest decision I ever made in my whole life. I mean, I, I say to this day, I'm, I'm terrible at making band names. I always was. I still am. I mean, it took us a long time to get something as simple as Jackson Pines, but I think at the end of the day, we made the right decision. We, uh, we decided we didn't name the band until after recording the first album because we wanted to, like, just record and then, like, see what the album felt like and title it. And we tried as hard as we could with the producer and our engineer together as like four people to think of a band name for two weeks when we did. And we came up with nothing. So when we got home, we got back to Jackson and the Pine Barrens and we just said, let's just call it Jackson Pines. We both were like, yep. <laughs> so when was the first time or how did you guys come together to be like, we need to kind of mix our talents together to produce music? So like, you know, the two bands, the one I was in, the one James was in, the band that I was in dissolved after high school, very typical experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to college in New York City for a year. Um, and at that time, his band uh, was playing and they like changed their lineup as well. So I made a new band with two other singer songwriters. So we were like three. So it was kind of like a Crosby, Stills and Nash thing. Didn't sound like it, but it was written like that. Um, and after playing as three, two acoustic guitars and a banjo for like five months, we were like, we really need like bass and drums or at least a bass player. So uh, James, you can probably say the rest. It happened in New Egypt at our friend Tom's house. Yeah, my uh, actually my buddy Matt Brown, who I was in my first band with, old Bank Shot, and uh, he had this black upright bass that was in his room, and he played it like twice and. I fooled around a little. I never really thought I could figure it out, you know, and then Joe and uh, Gary and BJ asked me to be in their band, which is Thomas Wesley Stern. Like, if you can find an upright bass, that would really be awesome. I was like, oh, well, Matt Brown has one. So he actually gave me the thing and I somehow I figured it out. And it's a it's still around somewhere. I actually got I don't know where it is, but it's a it's a terrible bass. It sounds like a shoebox with a the fishing line on it but uh <laughs> they got us through for the first two years or so and then i i got another one and then so and i got sl slowly got better at it and then yeah it kind of just worked out really well i mean it, we've been lucky we had a lot of people give us like help us out along the way and give us instruments and it's pretty wild but yeah it just kind of fell into place like that i was looking for a band to play with and my buddy was looking to get rid of an upright bass and it all came together. So. And and what year was that in? Um, it was 2010. 10, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago. It's 10 and, years ago. And your first album, which this is, so this is where I really in, really love the process of things. I like how things are recorded. I like the behind the scenes stuff with things. Your first album, which was the, um, it was an EP, correct? The the first album was okay. So actually, we did put out on Bandcamp a, a EP, technically before our first full length, uh, called New York Twenty Three A. I don't know if that's what you're referencing. Correct. Yeah, because that one, if I read it like correctly, that's the one that you guys recorded in a farmhouse with just one microphone. Yeah. So so that's why I didn't want to jump and say you were wrong because you are technically right. Um, that album disappeared off the internet for years, but you are, my friend, a good research. Um, so yes, the story goes that as we recorded our first full-length record, mm -hmm. we at the same time had my microphones and computer and everything at our Airbnb in the Catskills. So we would record the real full-length by day, 
all day, like, you know, eight hours, whatever. And then at night we'd eat dinner and hang out for a little bit and then we'd get bored. So I would turn on the condenser and we would just record with one mic in the kitchen. Wow. And that became the actual first EP because while we were waiting for the LP to be mixed, I could just mix that myself and we threw it online to have something out, to, to have something out, you know? Now, being able to record in the studio and record on your own, um, and I know things are different. They always have different sounds and some people love one way or the other and, and things. But was there songs on the New York 23A that were put on other albums or are those songs completely different than anything else you recorded? Right now, they're totally different. It consists of a couple originals and like a blues cover. Okay. Um, one tune is in contention to maybe be included on a future like full length. Oh, wow. Okay. The odds are still... Not in the song's favor as we speak. But there's always the calculus of that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, because that that came out in 2016, but what I loved about it when I was reading about it online was this idea of this kind of raw um, recording, you know, of just recording on one mic, being different in its own sense, not being in a studio with that. Um, and I, I didn't know at that time that you were recording the other album where it was kind of like a mixture of things. So you're able to see both sides of it at the same time. Now, I know Purgatory Road was recorded in a studio, and now was Lost and Found and the Gas Station Blues and Diamond Rings also recorded in the studio? So they were all recorded in different people's home studios. Sure. But, but like Purgatory Road was recorded um, with Simon Felice, who's you know, a member of the Felice Brothers. He produced the Lumineers' last two albums. Okay. Um, and when we recorded it, their second album was about to come out, which was cool. We got to like listen to some stuff there. But it wasn't your traditional studio. It was as professional as it gets, but it was um, Simon's barn, second floor level of a barn. So we were up in the Catskills in a barn, but it was set up with like the top equipment and a great engineer. Um, so that's how we did that full length record. And then the second, uh, so I guess our second and third EPs technically, counting New York uh, as the first one, Lost and Found and Gas Station Blues and Diamond Rings were both recorded in Eric Case Romero's home studio at the time was in Ocean, New Jersey. And he uh, is a, you know, sometimes member of the Front Bottoms. Um, he has his own, a bunch of bands of his own as well. Uh, and he's a producer in his own right. So we've actually like only recorded in people's private spaces, but they were very much real, totally professional studios. Whereas that first EP, was just the microphone we're using now to do this interview in the middle of a kitchen with us sitting in two chairs. That's that's pretty awesome. I, I mean, it's 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 a neat and unique experience. Now, when I when I think back to writing and stuff and recording an album um, or even a song, I'm assuming you bring everything because you do all this stuff pre going into a studio. You you have your music, you have everything put together before going into a studio. That's what 99 percent of the people I've ever interviewed have said. What is the process or how do you both come up with a song? Um, one song I'm going to keep bringing up because it has kind of become an anthem um, in the house for a song that me and my daughter have completely uh, fallen in love with dancing, um, which is Now or Never, uh, off of Purgatory Road. Like, explain to me how you both came up with the lyrics and music and the idea behind that song. So, you know, as with any kind of writing system, there's some variation, but most of the time the process is similar. So Now or Never was a tune that I wrote uh, the chords and the lyrics myself uh, at the time when our old band was dissolving, not knowing what we were gonna do next. Sure. Um, it wasn't written for Jackson Pines. It wasn't even written to be recorded as like admittedly some songs for our new EPs, we knew we were gonna record them, you know? but. Purgatory Road has a lot of material that was just written because I wrote it, not expecting it to be an album. So that was just me in my apartment at the time in Philadelphia um, and wrote the chords and lyrics, just wrote them in a Word document one day, recorded it on GarageBand and it sat there for a few weeks. So the process goes, then I'll go to James's house. I'll visit him for a rehearsal before a concert back in the day. We would be playing live a lot. Even when the band broke up, I would still get little gigs. You know, even if we weren't Jackson Pine, someone would say, hey, do you want to play this bar in Asbury? And I'd say, James, you just want to play the bass? We'll try some of my new songs. That's how Jackson Pines really started. It was like we didn't like purposely just 
make it to make a new band after one broke up. It just kind of, we started playing again and it just kind of felt natural. So now or never comes up one day in his backyard. I'm playing the chords and James says, all right, I'll take the bass. He just watches me and he starts figuring out the bass line to the chords. And then we played it for a month or two. Uh, and then around that time is when we sent it to Simon, who at that point was, you know, thinking about maybe recording a few of our songs. And that song is, you know, the one that helped him decide to try to actually do the session. So then we take it to the studio and all the other elements are added. So it was just bass and guitar in my voice. Wow. And that was what we thought the final version was. And then in the studio, it blossomed into a full band arrangement with Simon on drums, his brother on keyboard. You know, we went all out on it. Now, before you brought the song uh, to James and you had it all together, how much time did you put into making sure that song was ready uh, to move to the next level? You know, I, I don't know if it's ready to go to the next level until me and James take a look at it. Okay. So it really at that point is just the first draft, probably like, you know, half hour to an hour. That's, you know, it's, it's two, it's two verses that are kind of short for me. And it just kind of came out like a that it wasn't a song that I, you know, tried to write. It was a song that kind of like, it was just how I felt because I was feeling a certain way. And, yeah. then, and then James said, this feels like I love it. Then I knew that it was worth looking at it and then editing it a little bit. You know what I mean? No, I, I, I get it. And I, and I appreciate it. It's just, it's like, like I'm so jealous and envious of people that when they talk about a song, especially a song that I, you know, I, I fall in love with of some sort. And it's definitely a song I fall, I've fallen in love with that. Like, like, yeah, it took like an hour and a half to put together. Yeah. It's like, you know, it was, you know, I had it all together. It didn't take no time. It's, it's like the old like stairway to heaven. Like you know, you ask you know James, you know you ask Plant. And it's like yeah, how long it take you know stairway to heaven takes? It's like yeah, like twenty five minutes. And you're like, like a song like that or these that only takes such short periods of time to come together. I'm like thinking things like this take months and weeks and years to come together. And my bubble has completely been burst because um, I mean I was in, I was a musician. That's why I ended up where I'm at now because um, you know the band ended up moving here. But I mean I played bass, but God no, I couldn't. I didn't have a creative bone in my body to be able to produce anything of quality. Um, you know, it's just, I just wasn't talented enough. I, you know, I think it's amazing. I mean, the lyrics in your music have been something that I've, I've really, uh, you know, originated to that. I, I, I have a feeling towards you. If you read them, there's a story behind them all. Um, and the music is very God. I, I just, I don't even smoke cigarettes. Like I've never smoked cigarettes in my life, but I just kind of want to go like into the woods, like on an old rocking chair, smoke a cigarette, maybe something <laughs> legal. I'm not going to judge and just sit in the woods and just watch the sun set down to this music. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it is, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, well, I mean, I, I really, thank you so much. And yeah. that's like the highest kind of praise we could get. We, unfortunately we do have that effect on some people sometimes with the, smoking too many cigarettes, but uh, I'm just kidding. But, you know, to be to say what you uh, were alluding to, though, um, you know, it does in a way sound a little cavalier. And I hate saying like the lyrics themselves, you know, the first draft was it, it did happen in a sitting. But I think James can attest to the fact that from that moment to the many moments where me and James decided what the song was really going to be like in the end, all the way to all the hours we spent playing it live before we recorded it. And then all the shows we played it at where we realized this doesn't work, that doesn't work. Maybe this should be a little longer. This should be cut. And then recording it in the studio for a whole day, which was eight hours of the same song, because we, you know, some, we decided to do that record quickly on purpose. We did it in 10 days. That meant every song was one day of work. So I think things though can agree though. It, it, it does feel like it was quickly kind of, you know, this inspired moment, which, maybe the seed of it, the lyrical was, but I think James can agree that we did spend months and months and a year on it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's all been a process, you know, but yeah, it's some, I guess some come together more quick and uh, others take time, but yeah, it all, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's quite the journey. But. You know, coming when you, when you make a band, there's always like a vision of what you want it to be, right? Like everybody has that idea or process of how they want themselves to be portrayed or how they want to be visualized or sound or anything. Cause I mean, some bands have a big stage show. Some bands are just about the music, whatnot, and they see where they want to go in the future. What, 
and what is that? What do, what do you guys see yourselves, or what do you want to see yourselves be, or how you guys want to perceive in the next couple of years? I mean, like, what is the end? What is your goal for Jackson Pines? Well, I, I guess there's like a lot to that question. There's it's kind of twofold, maybe. Um, there's like a very um, technical answer, and then there's a very um, sort of I don't know what the aspirational answer, I guess. So the technical answer is, you know, in the next, I mean, let, let's be frank. Let's bring back See Here Now. See Here Now is supposed to be two weeks ago. And, yeah. you know, unfortunately, it was postponed. Um, and it's in, for some reasons, but we're also very happy and very humbled that we were included in the, the rebook of the show. They decided to book us again, which was a whole nother, um, you know, prospect. So we're very grateful for that. So what that means is we have a whole nother year to, you know, practice and to write and to record another album, maybe more if we're lucky, you know, but at least another album to have out for that festival. So the technical answer is, I mean, Jackson Pines for the last four years was known because of what we mainly did as a live band, as an acoustic duo. Um, and that's accurate because most of the time when you see Jackson Pines live, if you see us across the country, it's a 75% chance it's going to be just me and James playing acoustic because touring, that's just as a self-made DIY band, that's what we can do. Um, and then some of the time we'll be a three piece with our drummer. Um, but now moving forward into the next record and into the next year of playing live, you're going to see us become a little bit more of what you traditionally call a full band. So we're going to have our drummer almost all the time, Santo Rizlo, one of our best friends. I've known him since I was 13. We grew up on the same street our whole lives as kids. Um, sometimes we'll have our fiddle player. Sometimes we'll have our electric guitar player. Sometimes we'll have both. Um, so you can look to see us as, you know, a more um, developed version of ourselves, but the full band is not really going to change or take away from what our songs do, how they function, or how, like, our sound operates on, like, a listener, hopefully. But hopefully it will just add to the experience and sort of add dynamic and uh you know just kind of tease out the little things we can't do as only two people so that's the technical answer we're at see here now you're going to see a very full jackson pines i can promise you that oh that's awesome now let me now before we get to james and ask the same question what is if you could like I, everyone has a vision a vision in their head of like what like the perfect scenario for your band is is this like touring the country touring the world is it do you like it keeping it small and just kind of doing and doing what you're i mean kind of you know having that just around the country doing your own thing and continue to grow that way or are you looking for the the big picture like you want to be in front of as many people as possible every night playing your music and just and and being as big as you possibly can be how is that me that's you james oh yeah, um, for me, I just, I love just the whole thing, you know, I love, I, I, ideally, yeah, you want it to, anything I do, I like it, you know, you want to have some kind of success to it, you want it to work and keep the train rolling, but for me, I just, I love the whole experience, I mean, I've met some of the coolest people I'll ever meet just from playing music, whether it's in New Jersey or other states or other countries. I mean, it's, it's just a beautiful way to live. You know, you just, it's just a very, uh, it's very rewarding, you know, to, and then, like we did a lot of school gigs and stuff and, uh, we still had people come up to us. Oh, well you played for my son or my daughter back in the day and she's playing the upright bass now. Cause she saw you guys. And for me, that's, that kind of brings it all home, but I do, I love, it's just a great life. You know, you meet a lot of cool people and it is, it's rewarding. I mean, it's, it's a tough, uh, it's tough to pull off sometimes, you know, but at the end of the day, when something, when it all comes together, it, it makes it all worth it. And that's a gig like see here now, you know, it makes it all makes you realize why you do it. And, uh, but yeah, ideally I just, I'd like it to, the more people we play for, the better. I mean, I love to play for 50,000 people or 500 or five people, you know, it's just, it's great to do, but. uh Yeah, I mean, if we could, you know, get the uh, title on one of those Willie Nelson buses, I think we'd be all right with that, right? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, 
we could travel around and do it all year, I mean, we would. I mean, you know, right. that's, that's what we're going for with this, you know, next lineup and next album. But like James said, as much as, I mean, we definitely have always only done it to try to make people react to music in a special way and basically just kind of make people react to music the way we did growing up and the way it affected us. So, I mean, obviously for me, I'd love to be able to play, you know, in the summer, you know, art centers and, you know, play big theaters and open for people and headline our own things. But we're, we're, we're hoping and shooting for that for sure. But like I said, we also get to, uh, we get to do things like do educational concerts at elementary schools like Pete Seeger did. And we mm. get to play at churches for, you know, groups of family members and stuff too. So we always try to do it all. So a year that we can play for, you know, kindergartners teaching them about the history of American music. And that same year we can play See Here Now. I think that's like a win for us for sure. That's, that's pretty cool. I, I, I really, um, I dig that answer. That just makes, I think it makes me appreciate you guys even more is that you're just more, you're more humble and open. And, and I like the ideas and the concepts you're coming with for your future. I think that's pretty wild. Um, let me ask this because you did bring up a, a point and a couple things, and I kind of want to round robin this a little bit. You did say that you, you know, the music isn't really brought to the next level until you both are together to produce that music. Um, but now that you're bringing in other pieces into the band, is that going to change the writing process and tweak things a little bit? Or is it really going to come down to you two writing everything still? And it's really going to be, I mean, Jackson Pines will always still be you two. Well, I mean, at the atomic level, you know, at the nucleus, it's always me and James first and foremost. Sure. But I think James is the best person to answer that because this summer we produced a, a live concert film um, for the Philadelphia Folk Festival in August. We were lucky enough to be invited. It was the one festival we got to play this year. We just did it from home. Um, and you can find that on YouTube. But that process actually was one of the first times in a long time we played three brand new songs. And we wrote them as a five piece band together in okay. person at a rehearsal. So I think James might be able to say if it, you know, it probably changes it a little bit, right, James? Yeah, no, I mean, it's like, yeah, it's, it started with me and Joe, but I mean, it's, and the people playing with us, the drummer, the keys, the uh, fiddle player, they're all our best friends. So it's, it's almost like, it's just turning another page in the book, you know, it's just kind of just, it just works, you know, but it all, yeah, I mean, it all really revolves around Joe and his uh, songwriting. I mean, that's where it all comes from. So everything, it all kind of grows from there, but yeah, adding, uh, especially having the great musicians we play with. I mean, it's just kind of, it just works, you know, it's like, we don't even really like everybody just feeds off each other, you know, and it just, it's not even something you have to think about or say like in person, it just happens when they, when we're around each other. And it, it's yeah, we, yeah, yeah, I agree. Like with those three songs, we kind of would play them a bunch of times until we all would be like, yeah, that's the way to do it at the end. Yeah. We'd do it two or three times, but like it's so close, but I don't. And then eventually we'd all be like, yep, that's how we'll do it. And maybe not forever, but for the next recording. And then that's how we went about it. So, you know, it does add a little bit of a different thing to it. But again, like James said, the songs always start with the chords and words uh, that I come up with and the bass line that he comes up with. So everything else is secondary to it, but it, it has a little more voice than it used to. That's, that's pretty, that's, that's cool. I, I mean, it's just, it's growth and progression moving forward and, and with music and stuff. And I think that's, I think it's clever um, with, with us in this weird pandemic and us having to readjust life and with COVID um, going around, how has that affected you guys um, with the band in general? I know no one's touring really. Um, I know you guys just played a show recently, um, but in these last couple months, how has the pandemic affected you guys as a band? I mean, the first and foremost, I mean, we would have played probably at least, you know, 60 shows Oof. at least um and a lot of them would have been local but a great many of them would have been our normal yearly route which takes us through the northeast through the midwest through a little bit of the south we've been working for the last four years on hitting those areas consistently and growing pockets of friends and people there and this year we we're supposed to expand on that for the first time in two years and go a little further west and a little further you know out and up 
and we didn't get to do that. Um, you know, we normally play a good number of country fairs and, you know, these like real old timey fairs where we play folk music and country music and we like, you know, play like only like half of our originals and we, you know, really lean into what we used to do. Our older band was like a straight up folk band. Um, and we don't have that this year. Um, and we don't have the Asbury gigs with all of our friends. And we don't have the people in the Hudson Valley or in Nashville or in Georgia that we always go see every year. So that's been the biggest impact is even when we're in between recording albums, we're always playing shows, whether it's me and James or it's four of us or it's six of us at a big festival, right? So that's the biggest thing. And for us, it's not really like the financial thing. It is one thing. Like, you know, we usually make a lot more money playing shows. Uh, it adds up. But really, it's sort of like a more of an existential thing. Like, as an unsigned DIY, we manage ourselves, we book ourselves band. We're only as real as our ability to pop up and play for people who don't expect us. Because we don't have a PR campaign that tells you who we are. And we don't, you know, we're really, really lucky to have a lot of support in the tri-state area from radio stations, blogs, programs like yours, even local PBS and stuff. But we don't have that, like, national machine um, yet, you know, which I'm, I'm still, you know, uh, optimistic about. But with a year like COVID, it cuts off that lifeline because we were doing it all ourselves. Um, but at the same rate, we got to make a really high quality concert film, you know, for the Philly Folk Festival that if we were running our, our chickens with our heads off, like we normally are all of August, we wouldn't have had the time. We would have just had like a half ass video. Mm -hmm. So that's the one bright spot when it comes to the summer. James, what do you, what do you think? You saw the same feelings or change a little bit for you as well? No, that's. That's it. I mean, to a T. I mean, yes, yeah, it's, it's just uh, it's been tough to get used to just like, you know, every, stuff got kind of weird. Nobody knew what was going on. You know, we we're like, is it going to pass or is it? And then it just like flipped the switch and everything got shut off and you're just left to deal with it. And then so yeah, it took it took a while, you know, because you're used to, you know, going out on a Wednesday playing for all your hanging out with your friends and stuff. And, you know, nope. This is the uh, last Saturday, the first time or Sunday is the first time we've seen a lot of the, these people in what six months. I mean, it's seven it's months. Like, yeah. yeah, six, seven months. Like where we're, it's like a, just a tight knit community, you know, and everybody's kind of a, uh, it was just, it was, it took some time to get, uh, they're still not used to it, but it's, it's been tough adjusting to it. But hopefully it'll be back soon, you know when we can but yeah it's it's mainly that just the only it was just like turning the switch off you know and then it's like all right no more no more music till further notice and it it's still yeah. kind of in limbo you know so and now let me and with the way covid's been going on um has it helped or hurt the writing process for new music or has new music come because of the pandemic and how things are i mean um well, I'll say it's it's hurt as far as releasing because we would have had a whole full length out last okay. week or like three weeks ago. We would have released it right before See Here Now. Okay. But when it comes to songwriting, I mean, we have so much new stuff. I mean, right now we're looking at three lists of three LPs worth of material. Wow. Um, and it's like two 12 song albums and a 10 song album. But like by the time we get to all those songs, they'll all be there'll be new ones. Some will get pushed out. So right now we're just deciding what are the last six songs of our next album? Cause we have six that are like set in stone that are new that we could play live right now as a full band. Wow. Uh, and we only had two rehearsals this year because of COVID. Like, you know, we haven't been doing much, you know, we've seen each other like three times cause we were really trying to do it right. Sure. You know, we met safely to rehearse once before the filming and once to do it. And besides that, we just played the show on Sunday and that's it all year so we're now, trying. we can't see each other we can't play yeah now playing the show on sunday with the first show you've played in seven months what was that like playing during this, this is, I, don't, I don't know how to, how to describe it except this weird time and actually you know i was a little bit wary about doing a live show even though it was outdoors but the way it went yesterday and the way that the asbury park music foundation ran everything had it organized. I mean, granted, this was like the third or fourth week, so they have it down. 
it was great. I mean, it felt so relaxed. I mean, there was no anxiety. Yeah. Um, sounded good. It sold yeah. out. People were there. They raised a lot of money for the foundation after, again, seven months of, they only make money for the foundation by having shows. Wow. And they were only able to get back to it three, four weeks ago. Um, so it felt great. I mean, James, how did you feel? It was great to get back at it again, you know? Yeah, it's, it was awesome. Yeah, and yeah. like Joe said, they, they, they definitely handled it the right way, you know, they hundred percent. I mean, it was an awesome, as, as best as you can during these times, it was, that's how it should be. A show should be run, I guess for now, you know, it was, it did an awesome job and it was great to play. We saw lots of old, old friends and stuff and it was cool. It was like trying to get back on the wagon, you know, it was cool. Almost normal. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, yeah. Desperate. It's, it's, it's desperate times. I mean, I would right now pay to see an old man with a chainsaw play on a metal trash can. It's, it's getting bad, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, and I'm Jackson. We got a few. <laughs> yeah, we're in a New England. Yeah, well, <laughs> listen, where I live, I'm pretty I gotta, sure. I, yeah. where I, I'm very, I live, listen, I grew, I grew up in the Northeast, so Long Island, Massachusetts. I lived in Maine for a little bit, which was back. And then now I'm in, you know, Central Virginia. Um, I was, when me and James were talking before, like, I'm not far from, I'm like in between Roanoke and Charlottesville, like this, this town. And, um, but yeah, no, it's like, there is, it's, I think you, I think the music, your music fits to this feel of this town. Like there was, I was driving my, um, I have a pickup truck, which is hilarious because I never in my million life of years growing up, would I think I had a pickup truck, but listening to, um, you know, Purgatory Road, which like I said, it's just been on a constant repeat for me, you know, in my pickup truck, picking my kid up from school. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just got a, it's such a cool feeling. Um, it's just like, and that's what I love about music is when you listen to something and it makes you feel a certain way or, you know, give you visuals in your head or, or like you feel like this would fit something like that is what music's supposed to feel about. Cause it's what, when you're listening to music, it's supposed to be this release of not thinking about anything else except the music. You're not worrying about anything else. That's what I love about music. And I always appreciate about musicians, whether it's any music I listen to or anything I don't, it's, it's that you're creating something for somebody to kind of escape for a little bit. Um, and, you know, Purgatory Road, I believe is, oh God, I can, you know, it's, it's, it's probably a, a 39 minute, 34 minute long album, something like that. Yep, it's not very long. It's like a nice little, it's like a bagel. It only lasts the right amount of time. Hopefully. That, that, <laughs> that's a great way to put it. I stole that from Tom Waits. So it, someone's going to call me out on that. <laughs> oh, well, you know, that's, listen. A Tom, that's a Tom Waitsism. Oh. But, but yeah, no. funny that you know what you're saying about the pickup truck. Um, <laughs> I myself cannot claim you know anything like that. I drive a Civic, but James has driven a pickup truck since I met him when he was a 17, 16 year old kid, and driving around our hometown and driving up to New York and driving down to even Roanoke. Believe it or not, Roanoke is somewhere we stop on tour every year because it's the perfect distance between certain towns that we on tour so we've actually spent a good amount of time i know you don't live there but you're near there i go um, to i work in roanoke all the time we love we're, james we're how much do we love roanoke? the community and cheeseburger might be the best cheeseburger on the definitely on the east coast as far as i'm <laughs> that's one of our aunts when we get down there yeah. oh that's that's funny yeah no um but like James, you know, we just kind of decided we listening to music in james's truck for so many years we always wanted to make music that sounded good in a pickup truck driving yeah. down a country road, you know? If it doesn't sound good in a pickup truck, it's probably no good. So. <laughs> you can <laughs> quote him on that. That's hard. That, that's, dude, hard that, that. that's either a song or a t-shirt. I'm not sure. Like that is something <laughs> that should be a Jackson Pines t-shirt right there. If it doesn't sound good in a pickup truck, it, it doesn't sound good at all. That's That's a clever idea. You might want to trademark that quickly before someone takes that. That's actually how, like, a lot when we got like our trial CDs back in the day of like the before they pressed it, we'd like we'd go hop in my truck, put it on, and drive around like same down dirt roads around Jackson and stuff, and see how mm. it. That's kind of how it, like bring it to life, you know. So mm. and we did do that. Hell yeah! Now, if there's somebody now, because this show is um, it, it, it it's it's a very popular podcast. And a lot of people are going to be listening in. They might not have heard you before. If there was a song that you were to say, because I have my opinion, that you would say, if you want to know Jackson Pines and you want to 
figure out who we are. This is the song you should listen to before you listen to anything else. What song should we listen to? I normally answer that question first. So unless you are tongue tied, <laughs> James, you do it first. Are you sure? I mean, so for me, it's hard because, you know, almost all of the songs originate from me first. And there are some that, you know, we do come up with as a group. But like James said, almost everything is originated from, you know, me writing alone at first. So they're all kind of like, you know, precious gems that you just kind of send out into the stream and hope somebody thinks they're valuable. But I can't really choose one on that basis. So for me, I don't even think this is, I don't think I can choose a, a perfect answer, but I'm going to go with the statistics on this one. The statistics. Um, <laughs> the statistics say uh, the most people have come up to us and talked to us about, the most people have said, Joe, like, I feel like this was written for me about something I experienced or, or this song helped me or this song made me able to cry. Uh, it's, it's the song that has the most plays on all of our you know, streaming stuff. Um, people seem to really like, even when I'm gone, the first song from purgatory road. Um, and I, I, I would, I think that's a classic. Let's put that on the background a little bit. How's that? Yeah, sound? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This so has a, yeah, a beautiful guitar part. It's, it almost reminds me like of a lullaby. And then it, and you're the, now James, are you singing on any of the songs? Uh, no. Okay. I'm still trying to find my, uh, my maybe like five, ten years. We've been trying to get him to sing for ten years, and he always will only sing at 4 a.m. after a long night. Only at 4 a.m. This was the first song I had heard out of all the songs. And I will tell you, it does, I'm an emotional guy. I cry at everything. Like, American's Got Talent, that little girl comes on stage, she's gonna sing a song for her dad. I'm bawling, I'm bawling. You, you might as well just give me the friggin' tissues, it's done. From the jump. Yeah, but I heard, I listened to this about 10 o'clock at night a couple weeks ago. And it is, it's kinda like one of those songs, like you almost, it's like you sing something to somebody that I guess matters, like, hey, remember me. Or something, and I don't know if that's what that song's about, but that's my interpretation of it. It is very much like a lot of highs, beautiful, like, and the one thing that you do really well in this song is that, like, that, that, I don't know what you call, like, the, like, I'm not singing, but, like, the, ooh, that, that, like, that very, this. Yeah, this right here. Um, yeah. It's so, so well done. That was, um, you know, a producer actually, you know, pushing me to sing more and not just lay back. So he really helped that part come to fruition. Oh, God, yeah. It's so, 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 and such a great song to start an album. Because you go, I mean, it goes right into Purgatory Road after this, which is a very eye-opening song. Um, and then it goes into my favorite now, and never would be perfectly. If I'm going to introduce anybody, um, to Jackson, and this would be the first one I played to him, and I'm gonna play that now because this I feel like this has the full band feel like of what you're gonna be going out with. So, like, here's like, um, what I really love about you guys too is like, and I, I mean, listen, I am a bass player, so I'm you know, gonna be kind of pushy on this, but I love how the bass is very set forward. You can hear that over a lot of things for a lot of times. It's kind of set back a little bit. It's not as, as you know, um, pushed forward. It's a way to but I try to find that balance, you know. You don't want to step on too many toes, but you want them to know it's there, you know. So you got to... Yeah, and as a duo at the time, not a full man, Simon as a producer and Pete Hanlon as our engineer purposely mixed it so we didn't sound like a regular full band. We sounded like a bassist and singer with a backing band. Oh, it, Whoever, whoever that guy is, the damn genius, because that is exactly, exactly what this is. It is very much like this. You have come to company pieces, but this is really about you doing it. It's, it's so well done. Um, and then the other song that really sticks out to me on this album, um, uh, which is Sweet Water, which I was, this one, another song is very like, I just feel like I'm fishing. Like, this is like, yeah. you know, you're right on the edge of a lake. You throw it, you throw it on it, and you just, and this is just like one of those, it's one of those days you don't forget. Like, you know, you have those memories as a child of doing certain things, 
Like this is that song that accompanies those beautiful memories of yeah, no, this album is, is fantastic. And then I know, like I said, recently within the last three weeks, you put out um, your newest single because you've had, like I said, since 2017. So if you go on any streaming services, whether it's um, Spotify or iTunes, which is the most popular streaming services, you're going to find Purgatory Road. You're going to have find Lost and Found. You're going to find Gas Station Blues and Diamond Rings and Half Light. And Half Light is the newest single. Um, and then before that, in 2019, that was when Gas Station Blues and Diamond Rings came out. And then uh, Lost and Found came out in 2017, which was the same year as Purgatory Road. Is that correct? That's true. Yep. Do, do you see? Like, I, I Listen. You got it, man. I, I might not be a professional. I didn't go to college for this, but I do try to come prepared to these things. Uh, you, yeah. you know more about our discussion. Man, I, 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 didn't I, even, I didn't even know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, like I said, I mean, I got I to gotta look semi-professional, right? Um but Half Light, what I liked about this, that's different than Purgatory Road is, this feels like it's you two like playing to each other. Like you guys are like just that one mic feel. You two performing together in an intimate setting. And it's like, we're just kind of there. Like we're, you're giving us a, like a glimpse into something that is behind closed doors. I loved it. Well, you know, you, you're a very astute listener because uh, this is the only Spotify song, you know, or you know, whatever, Spotify, you know, what have you, iTunes, officially streamable song um, that was recorded on the same exact microphone as the first EP in the kitchen. So this is a return to that sound, but instead of it being us in the kitchen, it's me playing and then James just doing a little synthesizer. Mm -hmm. Or so it's the same idea, but instead of James on the first EP plays the um, slot key or the dobro, um, but in this it's just a it's a little tiny keyboard. Wow! Which is again a little hint at where we're going. Not not a total reveal, but just a little hint. Yeah, no, it, it's there's a, there's an absolute great collection of music out there from you guys. I am looking so forward um, to seeing you guys at See Here Now Festival, or if not sooner. Um, you know, depending on, yeah, you know, where you guys tour. And, um, I said, I'm not far from Roanoke, so that's a stopping ground. There's, um, that, that's hopefully, you know, we'll see. I, it, this is such weird, like, there's no, there's no planning. There's like absolutely, you cannot plan nothing. Like you can't plan shit. Like, cause who know. Hell knows if anything is going to change in three weeks. I know. All we can really do is plan to record, and on our Spotify it says we're doing "See Here Now," so that's about it right now. <laughs> At least our next show is a big festival of Pearl Jam. That, that's right. That's right. Wait, wait, wait. Saving Grace. Oh God! You know, and I will tell you this: I, I um, if this music's heard, I, I God, this is this is. Mm, 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 mm. Thank you, man. It's it's so good. I really think I, I think the future is extremely bright for you all, um, especially the fact that you guys are recording in a way that is not losing the that's not losing the true essence of what you guys are, which makes me really like you. That is, it's just you two, but now you're adding peace around you, but you're still highlighting you two. I think that is is um, amazing. And I'm not talking about you two like Sunday Bloody Sunday. I am talking about Jackson Pines. So um, we gotta keep that reel that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, no man, I, I've, I'm really excited about you know the future for you all because I really do think it's bright. I mean, this is this is something that you know fits that Americana sound. You know, when I was talking to um, a buddy of mine a few hours ago, we were I was he had asked who I was interviewing this evening, and I told him. And um, uh, let's see, there's a Patrick Cooter that is a Cooter. There he is. Yeah. He is uh, waving and oh, saying, hey. "Hello, Pat. Um, oh, it's good to hear from you, Pat. It's been too long, man. Thanks for tuning in. We love you." Yeah, and then there was a B Asbury. B. Asbury. Mm -hmm. Oh man! Oh uh, yeah, B. Asbury. She was um, her and her husband Terry. They're from West Virginia, but they lived in our hometown, Jackson, New Jersey, for years. And they were a house concert venue where we sort of incubated and learned how to be a. Uh, a good singer songwriter act. So B, we love you. Thanks for tuning in. Mm. Hope West Virginia is treating you well back home. Oh, well, let's see. 
this has been I, I think I've learned a lot about you guys. I think this is I think if, if anyone's listening right now that has, does not know who these two are, um, I definitely check it out. You can go to jacksonpines.com for all the information. You can go to YouTube. You can see this uh, the video they recorded this past summer um, that it, uh, they played music on. That was for the Philadelphia Arts Festival. The Philadelphia Folk Festival. The Folk 59th. Festival. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great things out there. There, there, there is a lot of music to listen to. Um, some good stuff. Maybe one day we'll get their first EP actually um, put out there. It's not on Bandcamp. It's just not on Spotify. Oh, we're gonna have, listen. You gotta, you gotta get on to that because you know you gotta move that stuff over. You gotta You're right. stream it on over. Um, You're right. I'm gonna do it tomorrow. <laughs> they, uh, listen, I'm gonna hold you to that. At two o'clock tomorrow afternoon, if I don't see that, there's going to be messages out there. Um, yeah. And then listen, I got some other people. Mary Ellen says, "Love you too so much." Talent. That's my, that's my aunt Mimi. Love you, Mimi. Thanks for tuning in. Um, Edward, oh God, he's definitely got a Polish that's, last name. That, that's my last name. That's my uncle. <laughs> that's my family, Uncle Ed, and my that's that means my grandma. Means my grandma's watching too. Hello, Grammy. So, the, so out of the um, hey, Uncle Ed, out of all twelve hundred and fifty-two people that have viewed this in the last twenty-five minutes, I guess all <laughs> all uh, eleven hundred and fifty-seven is your family. <laughs> yeah, they're all Lithuanians. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, hey, listen, we, you know, we stream everywhere. So, you know, I guess in Lithuania, there's a big screen on the side of a church and they're all, you know, clapping and cheering, <laughs> drinking the vodka, right? Between me and James, there's probably a couple of people in Ireland and Italy watching as well. Oh, that's awesome. Man. All right. Now, listen, I, I know we've had some sound issues of an echo or something, but Joe. We solved it. It's got a little bit. Yeah. Not terrible. But Joe, am I going to be able to convince you to play a song or two for us? I'm already reaching for my uh, my K right here. Ah, this works here. Okay, let me just make sure. Okay, yeah, I think this is gonna work well. Let me just. Uh, let, let, hey, let the, you know what I'm gonna do for you too. And, yeah. and no, no offense to you, James. We're gonna give the spotlight. Mm. Hey, let it rip. All right, let's let's do this. Let's get him on. Let's bring him over. Oh, look at you got the spotlight now, brother. Okay, so I'm gonna let James call the tune. Oh man. Should I play the new single? Should I play Should I play Now or Never for Anthony? I think I should play Now or Never. Yeah, play Now or Never. Oh, I, I wonder if I should get my daughter so she can listen. If she's not <laughs> asleep, I got the harmonica and everything. Oh, well, I don't know if she's awake or not, but okay. I'll, show her, I'll show her later. This will be streamable later, I'm sure. That's right. All right, let's do it, okay. I'm gonna test it real fast just to make sure I'm not clipping you out, and then we'll do it, all right? All righty. <laughs> That. that sounds good on my end. All right, here we go. Thank you so much, man. It's now or never from Purgatory Road. It's gonna be long, long road. God knows it's gonna be tough. No one ever said that it'd be easy, but we got no choice but to put the car in drive. Face of these trying to seize it. Oh, it is now. Now or never, oh, no, it's now. Now or never. We're gonna have to try. Stay up for night when it seems way worse than it is feeling. But if we don't give up, I know we won't fall as long as we can keep on dreaming. Oh, it's now, now or never. Oh, 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 oh,
spirits now, now, neighbors now. Neighbor, we can have it all. Doing it live, baby. Doing it live. You're welcome, man. Thank you. Yep. Um, so we have on Bandcamp, jacksonpines.bandcamp.com. Uh, all of our music digitally is for sale. And as of right now, we're limited to Purgatory Road. The first uh, full length is also available as a physical CD. Um, and in the next couple months, um, we're going to have a new merch line coming out, but that'll be more toward the, the end of the year. But you can still get the CD and all of our digital music online, Bandcamp. So it's right there. Oh, yeah, that's one of our old songs. Thank you, Pat. That's an old fan, man. You're the real deal. It's actually on a Thomas Wesley Stern album, our former band, but it's still on Bandcamp. You can find it. Uh, Linda, thank you so much. And that's what I was just saying. You know, we normally get to travel the whole Midwest and South every year. We miss all you guys and we want to get back down there. We'll see you next year, I hope. Yes. Thank you so much. 